This is a new Chevy Corvette Z06. <laughs> it's just stupid. I mean, it's ridiculous. 20 years ago, in order to have access to this level of performance, you basically had to be a professional race car driver on a racetrack. Now, any idiot with 80 grand can just walk into a Chevy dealer and walk out with a 650 horsepower sports car that'll do 202 miles an hour. Naturally, I'm in support of this. And it got me thinking, do we now consider the Z06 to be a supercar? Objectively, this thing is insane. 650 horsepower, 650 pound-feet of torque, 0 to 60 in 3.3 seconds, and that top speed of 202 miles an hour, all deep into supercar territory. And it's not just some crappy car with a big engine strapped to it. This thing costs a little over $90,000 with options. Think of it this way. This car is more powerful, has more torque, is quicker 0 to 60, and has a higher top speed than the Ferrari F50, which was the absolute top of the Ferrari world just 20 years ago. It's a $2 million car today. And yet, they sell this thing at a Chevy dealer, the same place you can walk in and buy an Equinox with cloth seats and hubcaps. The Z06 also sounds quite nice. Take a listen. You can see why I'm thinking this might be the first Corvette that's also a supercar. Now, I know there's an even more insane Corvette coming out, the ZR1, and that's why I'm putting up this video now. I'm going to show you the most insane Corvette ever made, and then in a few months, I'm going to show you the most insane Corvette ever made again. Anyway, I should mention that I borrowed this car using Turo, which is this service that lets you rent other people's cool, interesting cars instead of normal, boring airport rental cars. Turo gives me a budget to rent cool cars, and I chose this one. I rented it here in Arizona at Phoenix's Sky Harbor International Airport. So today I'm going to show you around the Z06, and I'm going to show you all of its quirks and features, and then I'm going to get it on the road and find out what it's like to drive a Corvette that has basically reached the supercar realm, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Z06, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer. Now I'm gonna start under the hood, which is front hinged. It opens up this way, and that's where you'll find the giant 650 horsepower V8. You can gaze at it in all of its giant GM V8 glory. On the underside of the hood itself, you will also find a Corvette logo. Not a small one, a giant one, and not just a Corvette logo, but it also says Z06, to remind you that this isn't just some wimpy regular Corvette when you're showing off your engine. Something else interesting on the exterior of the Z06 that I think most people don't realize is the fact that it's a convertible or a Targa or whatever you want to call it. But basically the point is the roof comes off. All you got to do is unlatch a couple of latches. One is on the passenger side of the top of the windshield. The other is on the driver's side of the top of the windshield. Then there's another latch in back you have to unlatch. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's all very simple. And then it just lifts right off like I just did. And then you can enjoy your Z06 with the top off, down, whatever. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, shouldn't the roof not come off of the high performance version of this car because of rigidity and stiffness for the racetrack? Ah, uh, but when you ask Chevrolet about that, they will tell you that this particular version of the Corvette has 8,000% more structural rigidity than the outgoing model. Actually, I'm not really sure what Chevy would tell you, but that's the kind of thing automakers say when you ask them about that stuff, so I wouldn't really worry about it. Now, moving on to back here, you'll find that this car is a hatchback or a liftback or whatever you want to call it. There are a couple of interesting things about the back of this car. One is that there's no way to open the back from the outside. There's no little release back here. You either have to press and hold the little button on the key fob, and that'll pop open the lift back, or you press a little button to the left of the steering wheel, and that'll open it. One of the things you'll find when you get back here is it's shockingly roomy. There's room for a ton of stuff back here. This car is not small, but it only has two seats, and the rest of it is 
basically devoted to cargo space. I was able to get luggage for a three-day trip in this thing with tons of room to spare. Also interesting in the back of this car, take a look at the back window. It's tinted, but if you look closely, you can see that the design that goes from clear to sort of the black part that rims the window, well, that's the Chevy Corvette logo, the little wings. Isn't that so cool? Now, there aren't many other especially interesting things on the outside of this car. Mostly, it's just a Corvette, except there are a few changes to make it into a Z06, like the wheels and the front lip spoiler and the side skirts, and of course, the little Z06 badge on the side. I also like another touch that's on all the Corvettes, and that would be the front turn signals. Now, the lighting on the outside of this car is pretty normal, except the front turn signals are really cool. Take a look at them. LED turn signals are not that uncommon, especially in nice cars, but I like that these are like a stair step of turn signal. One other cool item on the outside of the Z06 is the brake lights. They're supposed to resemble the wings of the Corvette logo when they're on, and you can tell they do make that cool V shape, which is a cool touch most people probably won't notice. Less cool, that would be the door handles. The door handles are just kind of a gimmick at this point. You reach your hand into this little cubby, you push a little button, and the door opens. I think that was cool when the C5 and C6 were around, but now I'd rather just have a normal door handle. Now, it's the same story inside the Z06. When you get in here and you're trying to get out, there's no door handle. Instead, it's a little button you push, and that electronically opens the door. Also worth noting is that if the battery fails and you're trapped inside your Corvette, you could just pull a little manual door release on the floor, and that will manually open the door mechanically. That way, you won't have to worry about becoming trapped in your Z06. Next, we move on to one of my favorite interior quirks. That would be the interesting badging in here, and specifically the one in the center control stack that says Z06 supercharged, 650 horsepower, 650 pound feet. That badge comes on all the Z06s, and it just it has no purpose, it just shows you what your horsepower and torque rating is. To me, that's a little much. Also a little much is the fact that the seats, which are very nice, grippy, well-bolstered sports seats, on the back of them they say, competition. <laughs> competition. So you know that you're in some sort of race car, you're competitive. Uh, come on, we don't need that stuff. This car is 650 horsepower. Let it speak for itself. Next up, I want to talk about this car's heated and cooled seat button situation, which is among the strangest I've ever seen. Okay, so this car has two seats, driver's seat, passenger seat. Both are heated and cooled. Seems simple enough, except the controls for heating and cooling for the driver's seat are mounted in the center control stack on the driver's side. Makes sense. The passenger seat, well, there is controls for heated and cooled seat on the center control stack on the passenger side, but there's also a set of controls for the same thing over on the far right of the car on the passenger side air vent. In other words, this car has two seats, but three heated seat controls and three cooled seat controls. The driver can only use one set of controls, but the passenger can sit here pressing buttons all day. More heat, more cool, more heat, more cool, more heat, more cool. I don't know why they put those buttons with the same function so close together, but they did. So the passenger, when they want to turn their heated or cooled seat, they have options. The climate controls have sort of a similar situation. The driver's side temperature adjustment is in the center control stack on the driver's side, but the passenger side isn't on the center control stack. Instead, it's all the way over to the right by the rightmost heated and cooled seat control under the passenger side air vent. So when the passenger wants to change their temperature, they basically have this all to themselves and the driver can't do anything about it. The climate vents in this car are kind of weird too. There's no sharing in this car. The driver gets two climate vents and the passenger gets to climate vents and that's kind of that. The middle vents are really kind of far apart from each other. In fact, the two vents on the passenger side are closer than the two vents in the middle. Also interesting about the middle vent is the fact that it has this sort of triangular shape, which it shares with the passenger airbag warning light and the hazard lights. The hazard light control in this car is this triangle that fits with the middle driver's air vent. Next up, we have to talk compartments. This car has a surprising number of interesting compartments, starting with the infotainment screen. That looks like a normal infotainment screen to you. Well, the little button to the left that says screen, you may think it just changes the menu setting. Nope, push it and look what happens. The screen retracts and then you have this little area where you can hide stuff from anybody who hasn't seen this video. Other compartments that are interesting, in the middle there's a compartment for the cup holders, except it's just kind of crap. It's really just a compartment and you can set up a little cup holder piece in the middle, which will almost surely get lost. This is about the chintziest cup holders I've ever seen in a car. The center console is very big, very usable, except it's hinged so that it only opens toward the driver. So if the passenger wants to use it, well, they just can't. Instead, 
the passenger can use the glove box. Now, there isn't anything particularly unusual about the glove box, except for two little things I've found. One is the owner's manual, and it's a pretty standard owner's manual, although I like these two little paragraphs. They're under vehicle care, and they say, the first one says, this vehicle's very precise steering and handling make it very responsive to road surface feedback. A slight pull may be felt in the steering, depending on the crown of the road and or other road surface variations, such as troughs or ruts. This is normal, and the vehicle does not require service. Then next, under tire chatter slash hop, when driving at slow speeds and very tight turns, the vehicle may have tire chatter slash hop. This is normal, and the vehicle does not require service. What do you want to bet they put those things in the owner's manual? Because confused Corvette owners kept coming in, people who had never had a sports car before, finally splurged, and they were like, I tire chatters, I don't get it, what's going on? So they stuck those in there to kind of limit that, which of course it doesn't, those people are still confused, and they still show up at the Chevy dealer. What was the other interesting thing I found in the glove box? Why, that would be, Right here, it is a state of Arizona traffic ticket for the owner of this car. I, like I told you, I rented this from Turo from a guy named Matt. Very nice guy. And apparently, he got a ticket for going 99 in a 65, because that's what happens when you have a Z06. I haven't gotten any tickets yet, but, well, the day is young. A couple of other interesting things inside this car. As you can tell, this vehicle has a manual transmission. It isn't a five-speed, it isn't a six-speed. This is a seven-speed manual. Not too many cars have that yet, but this one does, and it has one really interesting feature. On the back of the steering wheel, where the shift paddles are in an automatic car, there are two little panels that say rev match. Now, when you're driving along like normal, the gear you're in is indicated in both the center gauge cluster and in the heads-up display, which is kind of interesting. That's usually common in automatic cars. It'll say if you're in P, R, and D, but this thing tells you in your manual what gear you're in, which is interesting. But when you pull rev match, it turns yellow. That's because it's gonna start matching your rev. So if you make a downshift, you don't have to rev match for your downshift, the car will do it for you. Pull the paddle again, it turns back white, and then automatic rev matching is gone. But if you want it on, you can turn it on, and when the gear you're in turns yellow in your gauge cluster, your heads up display, that's how you know the rev match is activated. Speaking of the heads-up display, this is a feature I've covered in a few cars that I've reviewed, but it is cool. It's worth noting again. It's this little feature that projects basically out on the windshield in front of you, and it gives a few pieces of vehicle information, your rev, your speed, and you can configure it to show other stuff, or you can move it up or down with this helpful little button to keep it in your line of sight. This is a really cool feature, and frankly, I think all cars should have it, and I hope that they will one day. Next up, I'm gonna move on to technology, but one more piece before I do is the mode select button in the middle. You twist it and this car shifts between various modes, performance mode, track mode, whatever. There's also an eco mode, an eco mode, and a 650 horsepower, maybe supercar. Next up, moving on to the cool tech features of the Z06, I will start with the gauge cluster, which is surprisingly configurable and surprisingly cool, and it has a bunch of interesting features. For instance, go through the menus and you can find engine hours as if this were a piece of construction equipment. More unusual, it shows your lifetime revs, the amount of revolutions the engine has had since the car was new. Since it's divided by 10,000, this car's had almost 87 million revolutions since it was new. And on the subject of lifetime usage, this car also shows how many gallons of fuel you've used. This Z06 has used just under 2,000 gallons of fuel since it was new. There's also a little fuel economy chart showing your gas mileage in your last 50 miles, which no Z06 owner will ever care about. Of course, the Z06 also has all the usual performance stuff, like your G-meter and all sorts of measurements that show you the temperature and pressure of every possible orifice. I especially like the tire temperature screen. Instead of giving degrees, it just says warm, which is probably more helpful, frankly. The other cool thing is there are several different styles of gauge cluster. We've been in sport. This is apparently tour, but here's my personal favorite. This is track, and check it out. It looks like an old Honda S2000 gauge cluster with the tachometer displayed prominently across the entire screen. Next up, moving on to the infotainment system, which is similar to most Chevy infotainment systems with a couple of interesting quirks worth pointing out. For example, this car has the usual Chevy performance data recorder I showed you in the Camaro ZL1 video I've linked below, but check this out. You can define the finish line on whatever racetrack you're on. Follow the instructions, and then the performance data recorder will automatically start a new lap whenever you pass the predefined finish line, so you don't have to tell the system a new lap has started. 
Of course, also cool is that the performance data recorder uses a built-in camera to record your laps, and if you check this button, it will even automatically record whenever you hand the car off to a valet, so you can watch it later to make sure the valet didn't joyride your Z06. You just have to stick in an SD card, like in a normal camera. The other unusual thing is in the settings menu, in a setting called Calibrate Touchscreen, press it and it simply asks you to touch a dot in all four corners of the touchscreen, one by one, like a Chevy touchscreen whack-a-mole game, followed by one in the middle, and then the touchscreen is apparently calibrated. I have no idea what that means or what just happened. So those are all the quirks and features of the Z06, but I'm more excited about the next quirk, climbing behind the wheel of the wildest Corvette ever made and pushing all three cooled seat buttons as many times as I want. That and flooring it. All right, behind the wheel of the new Z06. The first thing you notice when you get in this car is everything about it is just kind of more. So it's just faster, it's louder, it's a rough low. Um, a regular Corvette is already kind of compromised if you want to sort of daily drive it, drive it normally. But this thing is just like, the second you turn it on, you know you're in something a little bit different, more special or more compromised, whatever your opinion is. You know, getting in this car after a long night or a long day at work, whatever, you might just be like, oh, I wish I was in a normal car so I could relax. And that's kind of, this doesn't feel like a normal car where you can relax. The ride quality is, is rough, it's harsh. Um, the suspension, I'm, I'm in eco mode because I wanted to see what that's all about. Uh, the suspension is really harsh even in that. I don't know how much the, the mode selecting really changes the suspension. I'm sure it helps. I'll switch into track and sport mode in a minute. But, uh, but in eco mode, <laughs> uh, or in any mode, you drive over rough roads such as this one, ugh, and it is rough, rough, rough. And you kind of get kicked around in this thing. Again, this is not a car you can relax in and just sort of cruise. Uh, this is a car you kind of have to monitor and deal with, uh, which of course is great if you're on a racetrack, that's what you want, or if you're you know driving for fun on a cool back road, you're really part of the car, but if you just want to hang out, it's like, ugh. Okay, that was me flooring it. Uh, the thing I've learned about flooring this car is it is really fast. The car kind of changes your opinion of what fast is. Uh, you, you probably thought your C5 was fast, whatever, until you got in this. Even a regular C7, I mean, the C7 is a fast sports car. This is supercar, deep into supercar level. Uh, this competes with all the major supercars. While I was filming this video on the road next to where I was shooting, an Audi R8 went by, and all I could think was, wouldn't even be close. <laughs> Wouldn't even be close. Uh, and that's a that's an exotic mid-engine, you know, people look at that and take pictures of it on the street. This is a Corvette. The sound is absolutely excellent. Really, really excellently good. Uh, it doesn't sound like one of those, you know, an exotic car where it's like, Neow! you know, it sounds like a big old muscly American V8. Uh, again, for better or worse, some people like that, some people don't, but that's what it sounds like. The owner has installed a short shifter in this car, so I can't really tell you how the shifter feels normally. I will say the clutch is very easy to use. Um, and the gear lever in terms of where it's positioned is just perfect. You're on the, the steering wheel, boom, you're on the gear lever. I mean, it's, it's really easy to, to get your hand on there and use it. Even driving on a relatively smooth road like this one, not only do you feel everything, but you hear a lot. There's a lot of tire noise. Uh, it's just, it is not a comfortable vehicle. From my time driving the last couple days, I can tell you, the steering is amazing. Really, really precise. Even just a slight turn of the wheel and the car follows exactly where you want. There is zero vagueness on center. Uh, it goes exactly where you want. And this car's width just makes it feel so capable when you're going around hard corners. Uh, you just kind of feel like you can put it at any speed, which is the problem with these cars, right? You do put it at any speed and then you run into some issues. All right, I'm gonna floor it here. I drove the ZL1 with this engine. But the thing with that the ZL1 is, uh, the one I drove was an auto. And it was fast and it felt brutal and it felt powerful. But with the stick shift, you just kinda, you feel more in control. It feels faster even though I think there's a chance it probably might not be. <laughs> this car is just incredible. I drove it here from Phoenix for just two hours and I just was wasting it. I was sitting behind me going 80 and thinking, I could be doing double this. And I'm driving in a dead straight highway in the middle of Arizona. There hasn't been rain in 10 years. 
thinking I could be going 200 right now and I would not be breaking a sweat, except I would be feeling every pavement undulation. Unlike Porsches or whatever, it just doesn't give you that sort of luxury car. You feel stable, but you also are kind of getting beaten up as it happens. This is sort of like a GT3 instead of, you know, a 911. So that's the Z06. I gotta be honest, I generally don't like big power cars. I like cars you can kind of finesse, use the whole car, use the whole engine. But I rented this thing in Phoenix, I drove it all the way here to Tucson, two hours, and I texted my friends when I got here and I said, this thing is good. And not just fast, but good. The whole package. And so when you think of it that way, maybe this should be a supercar, except it just isn't. To me, a supercar has to have a certain level of specialness, a certain rarity, and the same design can't be sold in some base level model that you can get for a lot cheaper, no matter how fast the high performance version is. It's the same reason the 911 Turbo isn't a supercar. And so the Z06 isn't a supercar. No Corvette really can be. Instead, this is just a sports car that outperforms a lot of supercars. And with that, Time to move on to the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Z06 is cool and fun looking, but I think the design has been too evolutionary since the C5, and I'm ready for a big change. It gets a 6 out of 10. Next up is acceleration. The Z06 is monstrously fast. It does 0 to 60 in 3.3 seconds, which gives it a 9 out of 10. Next up is handling, and the Z06 is among the very best, close behind the top supercars, and it earns an 8 out of 10. Cool factor, however, isn't as high. The Z06 has been out for a while, and they're getting more common. It gets a 6 out of 10, and in terms of importance, it also gets a 6 out of 10, as the Z06 is produced in surprisingly high numbers, and it seems like it will continue to be a relatively common sight on the roads. Still add it together, and the weekend score is 35 out of 50. That ties it with the Camaro ZL1 and places it just behind the Dodge Demon and the Ford Mustang GT350R. Truthfully, where I think the Z06 really loses out is cool factor is it's almost cooler to have the rare top-end version of the lesser model, like the ZL1, than the more common mid-level Z06, which slots between the base Corvette and the range topping ZR1. Anyway, on to the daily category, starting with features where the Z06 is reasonably well equipped and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort, however, is abysmal. It's just shy of being truly rough, earning it a 3 out of 10. Quality is decent. The interior materials are only okay, but reliability and cheap repairs are the Z06's main advantage over expensive rivals, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is good. It has 15 cubic feet of cargo space, which should give it a 4 out of 10, but low ground clearance, two seats, and terrible gas mileage knocked that down to a 3. Finally, there's value, and that's the Z06's strong suit. It's an excellent car, to be sure, but this sort of performance is mind-blowing, even for this dollar figure, even as pricey as it is. And it gets an 8 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to a mere 26 out of 50. Add it all up, and the Doug score is 61 out of 50, which places it near the middle, and also places the Z06 behind the Chevy SS, the Camaro ZL1, the GT350R, and the Demon. Those cars are all a bit more well-rounded than the Z06, and in my opinion, a bit cooler is the Z06 has become a little old hat by now. I suspect the ZR1 will do a bit better.